we're here with a new take on on identity, identity security, identity governance, and we're here to disrupt the space. These organizations are sitting on a treasure trove of data that could absolutely reduce risk. And a tool like this sounds awesome. We looked at this and we said, there's got to be a better way. You have to be able to go where the data is. And you have to be able to do this with a business user who we think of as somebody who is almost always a novice, like a perpetual novice. This needs a solution that just works and works with the system where the data is. And that's what we set out to build. We want to be the best integration platform that our customers can rely on. We're building a system around this to solve what is probably a decade-old problem, but it's one we are very confident about solving. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad. Yourself? Hey, did you say Identity at the Center? Because I thought this was AI at the Center. I think I'm on the wrong podcast. <laughs> Sometimes, but no. Uh, Identity at the Center. Uh, that is our maybe our, our future podcast, AI at the Center. But it seems like it's creeping into a whole bunch of different things these days in the identity space. I think you should just start getting the domain names locked down now. Yeah, I've already thought about that, but why don't we turn into, this is a sponsor spotlight episode, right? So we create these in collaboration with our partners that are out there and they come on and share insights and things like that. So to make it very clear, right, this is a very, this is a sponsored episode. So everything you hear is sponsored today by Zilla Security. Uh, we've had them on in the past. So they were with us back in March. We had Deepak Taneja from Zilla join us kind of earlier in the year. And that was episode, I think, 269 back in March. And so we've got another one today, and I'm very excited to announce we've got Nitin Sonawing. He's the Chief Product Officer and Co-Founder of Zilla Security. Welcome to the show, Nitin. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. And as I mentioned before, this is the second time that we've done one of these with Zilla, and the first one was well-received, and hopefully this one will be as well. I'm sure it will. Uh, why don't we get into this, though? Because you know this is the first time you've been on Identity at the Center, or AI at the Center, depending on <laughs> where we're going to go with that. Uh, how did you get into the space of identity? Is it something that you chose or did it choose you? No, identity Identity chose me, actually. I got into this, uh, this domain uh, when we started Zilla Security. And, uh, uh, you know, as I was getting off my previous startup and, um, and looking to do the next one, uh, a, a friend and ex-colleague connected me to um, my co-founder and our CEO, Deepak Taneja. And, uh, and we... Uh, you know, bounced ideas off of each other for quite some time. Uh, but very early on, it became clear to me, you know, hey, I want to work with Deepak and start my next thing. So, um, and over time, as uh, as the idea evolved, it turned into, uh, it turned into Zilla Security. So you're a chief product officer. I'm always fascinated by titles and roles in our industry. What does a chief product officer do? And that's a very good question. And, and, you know, and another dimension to that question really is the role itself changes as the company changes and the company grows. So uh, at Zilla, I run our product and our engineering teams. Um, so um, both on the engineering side and on the product management side. Um, and, you know, the role has also evolved over time. Um, so early in our days, I would write code. Um, and uh, and now less so. Uh, now there are better people than I am that write code, better engineers, <laughs> and uh, and also better people who are better product managers than I am uh, that uh, that do the product side of things. So that's how the role has evolved. And you know, as uh, as the company will continue to grow, uh, it will evolve even more. Yeah, I feel like that's an important part of of any role, right? You have to adapt to whatever whatever the needs are of the organization or the moment, wherever that looks like. For people who are not familiar with Zilla, if they missed the first episode that we did, tell us a little about Zilla Security. What is it that, that you guys bring to the market that people should be aware of? Yeah, so at Zilla Security, you know, we've really taken, um, 
you, you know, step step back. And, and as you know, our our CEO, my co-founder Deepak Taneja, spent an entire uh, career in the identity space. Um, and uh, and I think you, you folks in, on an episode that he was on, you called him like the Tom Brady of identity. And, and honestly, it, it is so apt. Um, and in, in part, actually, I really wanted to come on a podcast uh, podcast with you guys uh, also because, you know, I'm not from the identity world. And uh, and like today's episode, to me, it feels like I've arrived. Right. So um, and, and just I, you know, one of your episodes I listened to and it was like, boy, that intro music, like I got to get on this podcast. <laughs> um, so. Um, Flattery so, will get you everywhere in this podcast, and <laughs> keep going. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, all, all that said, so uh, you know, with Deepak's background and deep expertise, and uh, and sort of a fresh set of eyes at uh, at at the identity space, and honestly, as uh, as the tech world at large as it has evolved over the past decade or so, and there's a couple of you know completely uh, orthogonal evolutions that have happened in the space. Right? One, of course, is cloud and SaaS and everything else has taken on a scale and magnitude that it never had uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but the second thing that's happened is the level of business involvement in systems and applications and business owners and people who really are not uh, you know, uh, IT administrators, leave alone identity people, right? They're not responsible for uh, for managing, uh, you know, r- really much of what it turns out to be identity related. And so, uh, you know, at Sozilla, we're, you know, we took a look at, uh, look at this whole landscape and there's got to be a better way to do things than what the legacy systems have taken the path down. So we're here, um, you know, we're here with, the, um, uh, you, you know, with a, 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 a new product, a new um uh, Take on um, on identity, identity security, identity governance, um, and we're here to disrupt the space. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the business because I feel like this is something where you know, if you're if you're in this industry, especially if you're working as part of an IM real world scenario, a lot of times there's this idea of like, hey, we want the business to be more involved in identity, but they're not identity people, and yet we're asking them to make decisions on. Is this access appropriate? And we just kind of assume that they know they know, that they know those answers, and that's, that's not always true, right? That's right. In fact, in fact, what's interesting is that uh, we are now more so calling on business people to do a lot of things for us, right? We call on them to set up and configure and build integrations into systems. We call on, and when that fails, we call on them to do screenshots and screen scraping and things like that. And we call on them to do uh, access reviews and we put in front of them some very complex entitlements and tell them to say it's okay. Uh, and more often than they don't know what to do. Uh, and so they do what is, um, you know, naturally allows them to go do their day job, which is to say, say approve all and they move on, right? So I think increasingly we've called on, um, you know, business users, and we'll continue to do so, right? Because this this is not a, um, you know, this is not a, a trend that's going to disappear overnight. This is a long-lasting tectonic shift in the way uh, IT uh, operates, and this is here to stay. So uh, everything we do around, um, you know, around security in general and uh, identity, particularly in this new uh, modern world, uh, plays a much more central role uh, than it ever has. So it's all it's plays a central role around security, and you know wherever there are security concerns, obviously compliance follows because compliance wants you to show them that you're doing what you said you were going to do, and and so now you have a security problem, a compliance problem uh, in this particular new world. Um, and of course, if you are giving people access and you're taking away access, you have a provisioning deprovisioning problem, right? So, so it's all, you know, it's it's all uh, in some sense a, a new world where uh, business users are being asked to play much more of a active role uh, in something that they'd rather not do. You know, Nitin, um, we've reached out to Deepak Tanasia, whatever it was, maybe six nine months ago. I guess he's really somebody who was around the beginning of identity. But then he was one of the key people 
who kind of developed this IGA space. And IGA space, in my mind, is all about ensuring that the right people have the right access. I don't think IT or information security can make the decisions on who gets access to what. That's got to be the business users. But what IT or IS needs to do is give them systems that make sense that they can use to do that role, to fulfill that that role that they have in managing access. And one of the things that like knocked my socks off with the Zilla platform is what you do with Zeus and the ability to kind of use a tool that I've never seen and I, I still haven't seen from any other vendor. I'm not just saying that because you're doing a sponsor spotlight, but seriously, this is innovative stuff that people need to go out and check out if they haven't already, which just kind of like highlighting on your screen where certain fields are so you can do an access review. So it's that level of automation that can really enable a business user. It's not just, you know, using more friendly business terminology, which basically gives it a quantum leap. But now that you've introduced AI into the process, I mean, fundamentally, like, in improves your ability to put those decisions in the business's hands. That's right. And, you know, again, uh, we, we we took a step back and we look at what our customers were doing, right? And our customers um, and, and the people we wished would be our customers when we started Zilla Security, uh, you know, they, they, they had this problem um, in, in droves and the, uh, you know, it, it was appalling how, how we ask uh, business users uh, often with who have who manage very sensitive systems, right? So these may be things like banking portals or insurance portals or, you know, um, and things like that for where there's a real need for identity governance, right? And so uh, we looked at this and we said, there's got to be a better way. You have to be able to go where the data is and you have to be able to do this with a, a business user who we think of as somebody who is almost always a novice, like a perpetual novice, because he or she gets called on to do, particularly when it comes to things like SOX compliance, gets called on to do this uh, every few months uh, or so, or you know, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever your cadence might be, and they dread it. And, uh, and so Zeus was born out of this, you know, this needs a solution that just works and works with the system where the data is. And that's what we set out to build. You know, in fact, uh, one of our engineers um, who, who uh, spent time building, building Zeus, uh, somebody that I'd worked with ever since he was an, in, in, you know, I joined me in a startup many moons ago as an intern from MIT. Uh, and, you know, and he sort of really got creative with how we can make it uh, you know, uh, super easy to essentially learn from the DOM of the, uh, you know, of the console of the application that that you're on. We even we filed a patent for the work we have done. Uh, we're very proud of it, uh, and you know, we have taken it many many steps further, and we continue to we we intend to take it even more uh, further, so that you know, the app owner just simply trains us. It's a one time exercise. From then on, we know. Uh, what the system is, we can enable them to set Zeus up so that it it runs in a headless browser on a nightly basis. It's able to bring in credentials from a secure storage vault, log in into the system, get the uh, identity and access data, whatever it needs. You know, we we extended uh, Zeus to be able to go grab things like last login, you know, this is always a blind spot and like, are people using the stuff that we give them, right? Uh, what, what the MFA status of this account that they have access to and any other data that's present in the system. And it comes back into our, um, you know, a, a, into the Zilla uh, system, if you will. So we're very proud of uh, Zilla Universal Sync, but more than that, you know, the I have been surprised at how effectively many of our customers have used um, Zilla Universal Sync or Zeus to solve their uh, business pain point. 
you know, I, I'm going to echo what Jim said. I, I have not seen another capability that looks and feels and smells <laughs> like Zeus. It's very, it's very interesting. I would definitely encourage people to go, go back because we did spend time with Deepak talking about that earlier this year. So episode 269, go back and, and watch or listen to that one. Um, let me put you on a spot here real quick because something you just said sparks a question I've got. You were, said you were surprised at kind of what your customers are doing with Zeus. Is there something... You know, is there a creative thing or something in which is like, wow, I never really kind of thought about it from the angle that is like, oh, like, what does that help me manifest the surprise in my brain? Yeah. So the, so the, so the thing is, you know, and I think you, you, you alluded to earlier, which is, you know, the identity governance and Deepak was part of sort of forming, forming the identity governance space. You know, last week we were at an event here of, of CISOs in, in Boston and, uh, and we jokingly said, you know, Boston's the birthplace of IGA. Um, and which is really true because, you know, because IGA was co-founded by, in part, uh, Deepak sort of was an outcome out of Sarbanes, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley regulations and uh, and things like that because it was intended to avoid a lot of fraud, right? And so so if you, if you come back and say, okay, well, the whole purpose was uh, do identity governance because people do bad things with the access that you give them. Uh, sometimes they do trades they're not supposed to. Sometimes they do just downright, downright um you know financial fraud and so this means at its core really it comes down to is that there are systems where people have sensitive financial transactions can be conducted and uh, and things like that and and that's what they need governance for and and what surprised me is how many of these systems are just so you know 1990s if you will Right. Like or um, and they are that way for a good reason, because, you know, a banking portal has no real business driver to just become modern because we all say so. Right. Like uh, but that the governance problem doesn't go away. Right. Or, um, you know, or even other administrative systems that you look back on and go like, oh, yeah, it is critical. It is very important that there be governance around who has access to being able to manipulate your corporate Wi-Fi network, right? Of course you need to be governing that. <laughs> like, yeah, and that's, that's not important. <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of what I mean by I've been surprised by that is because the range and the breadth of systems that have, you know, that have been used uh, with Zeus particularly and all our other uh, integration capability, right? So one of the, uh, you know, one of the observations that Deepak also had early on uh, in the founding of Zillow is basically, look, you know, IGA pl- programs go sideways because they just don't, they just don't succeed at onboarding systems, right? And whatever terminology you use, whether it's onboarding systems, whether it's integrations or whether it's, you know, uh, the the reality is it's all anchored in being able to effectively connect to the systems that you're trying to govern and be able to either collect from them if all you're doing is compliance or being able to provision into them, deprovision into them, and so on, right? So IGA programs are anchored in integrations, right? So that was, you know, that was an early observation. Like, you know, if, if there was a thing that said, you know, this I believe, right? Like, and so I think at Zilla, this we believe. Right, like IGA programs are anchored in integrations, and so we're like, okay, well, if that's the case, we gotta be. If, and if that's the case, and that's the pain point that our customers are facing, and the customers we want to have are facing, um, then the we've gotta be an amazing integrations platform. So let's go build that, right? And so you know, all the API integration capability that we have built, all the stuff that we have done with Zilla Universal Sync, all the things that we're building in order to be able to get in a very secure manner in a hybrid network, all of that's kind of born out of it, right? So, which is that we want to be the best integration platform that our customers um, can rely on. Uh, And, you know, Zeus was part of that. Um, We've also done... Um, and Zeus is all no code, right? So nobody needs to write Java code. I was gonna say it doesn't uh, get much easier than point. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, it's a, it's like you're on an identity, uh, you know, identity and access team in a in any enterprise. Uh, I mean, like, do you really have the ability to hire Java developers to go build stuff for you? Um, or um, you know, so it's a challenge, and it's a very practical. 
the practical reality of the world we live in. So, you know, Zeus is no code, um, you know, in addition to a very large number of API integrations that are out of the box in the Zilla product. Uh, we've built uh, no code capability so that you can simply tell us for a system that Zilla has never seen, you can simply tell us this is going to be OAuth authentication, by the way. Here is the client ID. Here's the client secret. Here's the REST API endpoint that you can call to go get the user record. Um, and here's what you would do to go get the group record. And in, in a short period of time, you will have built yourself an integration, right? Um, and so that's sort of the standard that we're holding ourselves to. And, uh, you know, this started validating itself early in Zilla's life because we would routinely, and that was the time uh, when I did POCs. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's like the chief product officer job evolves over time. Um, and but I would do POCs, and it was very important to sort of learn uh, you know, uh, learn from the customers first and it continues to be so. Uh, but it was like people would tell us that, you know, I've done more in the hour that I've been on the Zoom with you in a POC than I did at my previous job, right? Like it would be, uh, we would hear uh, things like that and that's sort of validated that, um, you know, the belief that we hold here at Zilla Security well, now, now Zeus is old hat, right? There's new stuff coming up. <laughs> oh, it's going to be amazing. I think there's a lot, um, you know, there's a lot that we are doing uh, with w with Zeus. Um, there's a lot we want to do with um, no code integrations. Um, we are in the process of building, you know, community that can collaborate on sort of, you know, helping each other uh, and uh, and with the integrations that, that get built. Uh, you know, this thing that's taken the world by storm in the past year or so, uh, large language models are amazing at figuring out stuff that's in public documentation, right? So we want to figure out how to bring that to bear um, to, uh, you know, to essentially solving the foundational problem, which is, look, you got to make it easy for an IGA program as it gets up and running to just integrate. Uh, and then the program <laughs> runs on top of that. It's kind of like you can't lay a foundation and, and build an amazing house on a rickety foundation. I think that's really how we see it. Well, you can, but it'll fall over pretty quickly. It'll right fall away. over pretty quickly. <laughs> not, not advised. Well, why don't we talk about uh, what's coming up next? Because you're, you're here to tease some new features and new capabilities that are coming up for Zilla, right? Yeah, so you know, you know, we've we've uh, taken a, a real hard look at at uh, IGA and sort of uh, you know the, the the problems and all of the manual work um, that people have to do and people called up, get called upon to do and the thing that we talked about, right? So what are we working on? Is you know we we uh, a year ago or so uh, as we started taking a hard look at sort of AI and ML and uh, and we did a bunch of experiments. And we're like, okay, what is it that we can do and build that adds real meaningful value to an identity team and makes a difference, right? There's a lot of gimmicky things that one could be doing and, and, uh, and uh, you know, we're sort of shying away from that. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the fact that we call upon people to do the same sort of access review quarter after quarter after quarter um, is just, you know, it just shouldn't be this way, right? Um, and so we're bringing AI to bear on a, uh, you know, on a somewhat age-old problem, which is how do I take all the data, this amazing set of integrations that are there in the Zilla platform that connect to your all the systems and now knows who has access to what. Now, how do we take that who has access to what at an individual level and, and have a machine learning model learn from all of that and say, okay, from here what I can tell with, with a high degree of confidence that just about everybody who is doing QA has this access in um, you know, in Jira, for example, right? Or all salespeople should have access to Salesforce, right? I think we as humans intuitively understand that. 
But we as IGA practitioners have failed to take that intuitive understanding into practice, right? Like, so, so, uh, and, and, and honestly, the problem here is that, uh, you know, even people don't know where to begin, right? And people don't know where to begin. And it used to be uh, there were valiant efforts made uh, a decade or so ago, uh, including by some of my colleagues here at Zilla to help organizations uh, figure this out by creating, you know, uh, what one might call now organizational roles, right? And organize sort of these teams that go and uh, a, a role mining team that centrally tries to figure out who should have access to what, and and then they try to solicit feedback from business users who want nothing to do with this, right? Um, Having been and, on one of those role mining teams, I can tell you it is tedious work yeah. and sometimes effective, <laughs> and sometimes effective, right? And so it's it's so you know one of our um, team members here uh, who, who was on the founding team at uh, at Deepak's previous company, you know, he uh, Dan likes to say you know roles and and he he spent just like you, uh, Jeff. He worked with the largest enterprises in the world, uh, trying to help them solve this problem by what was an emerging uh, emerging tech at that time, right? And and he came to the conclusion. He goes, you know, rolls are like a floor wax and a dessert topping, all at the same time. <laughs> you know, and uh, the first time I heard it, uh, I was like, you know, uh, fell off my chair laughing. Uh, but it, it is like, you know, it it just doesn't work. Uh, and you know, it has a lot of promise. You embark on these things with a, a tremendous amount of promise and hope, and and. Um, and a lot of uh, man hours and sweat later, um, you know, uh, they're out of date, right? So, so, but, and and part of the other issue has happened, and we, we talked about this earlier, which is like, you know, the, the context of what type of individual in the organization should have access to what type of app is now even more federated than it ever was, right? So, so while one might argue that, you know, 10, 12 years ago, the central IT teams had some hope of doing this. Uh, you know, it's like here we are in 2024. They have no hope of doing this. Right? Like, they have no context yeah. um, left anymore. And so, uh, but the context is then in the business, right? The application owners know this. And when you logically say to the person who owns Salesforce, all SEs have this, and they, yes, yes, I know, I give it. Um, and and I review it, and so uh, you know the the our goal is bring machine learning to bear on this problem and really help the business owner out in a manner that they can then say okay this makes sense to me everything else is an outlier uh, and that I'm happy to look at by the way because they're outliers but the things that are not um, are ones that. AI is able to identify in a meaningful fashion and and then allow you to then make a very defensible case to your auditor, uh, which is what the auditors also want to see, right? Um, uh, and so at a very high level, you know, that's sort of what we're working on. Now, of course, there's a lot of complexity behind this, um, you know, and uh, there is a, the data that we get from HR systems and so on has attributes in it. We have to leverage them. We have to make sure they're right. And so we're building a system around this to solve, you know, solve what is uh, probably a decade old problem, but but it's one we are very confident about about solving. It sounds like a really interesting capability, and one that's important too, because I think it's this it's this application of data. Right, that you've got in your organization, and now how do we use that to make our lives easier? Which I'm I'm always a fan of. I would imagine you know this this comes into a situation where why do we keep asking the same questions over and over again if we know what the answer is going to be? Right, it's kind of like doing an access review for access review sakes. Yes, here is Jeff. Here is Jim. They have access to this. Of course, the answer is always yes because of the role they're in. Why are you asking me this? <laughs> that's correct, and that's what's so frustrating for. Uh, business users and supervisors and so on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so a, a system that can get away from it, uh, but then more call attention to the things that actually need attention, mm -hmm. right? I think that's really, uh, what's getting lost in this is, you know, you, you dump a pile of stuff in front of me and then expect me to, which is not my job at all, 
to sift through every single you know leaf in that pile. <laughs> and, right. and and so and all they're going to do is just kind of like yeah I didn't find yeah, it and then move on after like five seconds and move on exactly <laughs> right exactly so whereas this will this will meaningfully help people focus on the things that really matter and uh, and pay close attention to that administrative privilege that's been sort of being handed out like candy perhaps and uh, and and immediate things like that right uh, which is really what we want and you know again. You know, this is both a compliance outcome. Of course, that's what brings people, forces people into action often. We wish it wasn't that way, but it is what it is. Uh, but compliance is there for a real, you know, business reason, which is, mm-hmm. look, the business doesn't want to have problems uh, and data leakage and, uh, yeah. and breaches and things like that, right? There's not a single business leader that would say to you, yeah, I'm perfectly fine with the breach, right? Like that would never happen. Uh but if you uh, if yeah. you want to be a hero to the business, make their lives easier, easier and get them easy buttons to reduce risk, reduce effort, things like that. I think, you know, that's that's something that everybody who's listening to this probably should be thinking about for what I am. Like, how is this feature or thing that I'm doing helping that helping either of those efforts? I'm curious. I, I know we're kind of teasing this this capability coming out. Are we able to share the name yet of it? Like, what's this thing called or do we need to wait a little bit for that? Yeah, I think you know we're putting finishing touches on uh, on this. We'd love to uh, tell the world more about it um, pretty soon. Um, and you know, and and the the ultimate objective in this is, which is, you know, when my when a new employee steps into the door at my company, I should be able to figure out what access they need in order to be productive on day one. Right, uh, and it should not be something like oh, make them like John or make them like Jane, because you know what? No, Jane's been around here for a while. Jane has a bunch of administrative access, right? Because uh, Jane's super smart. We don't know about this person <laughs> and super careful. Um, but uh, so, so, so I think that's really uh, you know, and and in a way that is uh, that makes that person productive. Uh, again, we talked about the security side of this. You know, we wanted to make sure we do this in a least privileged manner. And um, so, you know, tee up sort of like the the three stools we think of, of identity governance, the three legs of the stool, the three stools, uh, three legs of the stool, uh, you know, sort of the, the security compliance and uh, uh, and provisioning, which is making people more productive as quickly as we can make them. So, Newton, you talked in terms of outcome around a compliance outcome, but I'm seeing many other outcomes. I'm seeing a security outcome. So, Jeff and I often use this um, fictitious scenario of, do people really need to approve access to the cafeteria menu? Do you have an application or a file on a share that is the cafeteria menu? Does someone actually have to go and approve that? Or is the risk so low that we could just give anybody permission to the cafeteria menu has an account? They've, they've gone through enough vetting that that information is so low risk to the organization, it doesn't have to pass through human hands. And by not passing through human hands, you no longer have the hurdle of, now I have to manage X number of approvals and I start getting into rubber stamping because this is just too much. I have a day job. I don't want a part-time job approving access. So now you have, well, obviously the efficiency driver because there's fewer approvals to make. You have an accuracy driver, which leads to better security. So you have a security driver. So I, I, I'm seeing all those things in, in what you're saying. That is that is exactly how we... Um you know, we, we see the world too, right? Uh, which is, and and an early advisor to Zilla, was a CISO, uh, he said to us, you know, he said, I think of security and compliance as two sides of the same coin because compliance is all about, about demonstrating that the security best practices uh, that you said you intend to follow are ones you follow, right? And so, uh, you know, security and compliance uh, outcomes kind of go hand in hand what is interesting is that the compliance outcome comes with an additional burden. 
And you alluded to that just now, which is about accuracy and completeness, right? Um, and because, you know, because as soon as it becomes a thing of compliance, now the auditor wants to, wants evidence. And so, uh, you know, another problem that we uh, set our eyes on at Zilla uh, around access reviews was sort of like this evidence problem, right? Which is, which is, you know, now now we're kind of flipping it a little bit, right? Think now I'm a business user. My job is to make sure the organization is compliant, right? So in the same way as that the other business users have their job to do, I as a business user have to become compliant, right? And so, so you know, our direct customers, the people who buy uh, the Zilla product, they need a business outcome. And their business outcome is, uh, is no dings on the audit, Certainly not socks and things like that, because that gets the CFO's attention, and nobody wants the CFO's attention. Um, and uh, and prove it to auditors who, in their past life, have been accountants, because they're they're making they're used to making sure that the pennies add up, right? And so 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 on the compliance side, we're faced with auditors who really check every bar line, and they need all the evidence, and and so. That's another thing that we brought automation to bear, right? Which is, look, nobody should be manually saving these things in Google Drive folders or in SharePoint folders and um, and things like that. It's like, why can the system just not automate this? Um, and that's the other thing that we do with, uh, with part, part of the Access Review product is we just automate all the evidence collection. And in some sense, we help the organization with a business problem. In this case, happens to be. One yeah, I kind of feel them. like um, in this case, when it comes to AI, it can take that compliance outcome because you can achieve the compliance outcome the old way, which is you need to review and approve every single request. The security outcome is actually improved by inserting AI by just putting a focus on what humans really need to decide. Now the AI has to learn and be able to accurately recommend or make decisions that are going to, that auditors aren't going to question. And so it's, there's probably an element of, you know, people have to build that, um, that confidence auditors, it people, um, but I think it builds over time, as you can show that actually we're getting more accurate results using AI than having people, you know, potentially rubber stamping access. And if you use a, a risk model and speak in the terms that CISOs think in, right? I mean, all of us as identity consultants and practitioners, we're in the game of, you know, being risk evaluators and, and speaking in terms of risk. And this is really about reducing risk that's Which, right that's the, that's the goal of compliance but that when you look at actually how you achieve compliance it's it's, it's i don't know that it necessarily always drives better security that's 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 exactly right and in part i think it happens because um you know because you're overwhelming uh you know you're overwhelming people with things uh and you know what you put your finger on is ex exactly right. I think being able to assess the risk and calling attention to uh, the entitlements that are high, uh, high risk and highly sensitive uh, versus you know I, I like the cafeteria menu uh, analogy right because because you know it's it's you should not they should not get commingled in a manner that. Um, that everybody thinks of uh, uh, the, you know, the administrative entitlement in an AWS account equivalent to a cafeteria menu access, right? Like they're completely uh, very different levels of risk. Um, you also want to call attention uh, to uh, to other aspects of uh, as well, like you know, uh, for example, uh, identities now that are related to uh, machine integrations, right? So identities that are uh, service accounts intended for a application, uh, identities that uh, you know inherit uh, uh, entitlements in not very obvious ways, right? Uh, 
um, and this is where we can bring uh, bring even large bring AI and m- more more specifically large language models to bear. You'd be surprised at how good they are at being able to tell you whether an AWS policy is something you should consider privileged or not. You know, and and most people can't do that. <laughs> so, so again, I'm I'm a tinkerer, right? I want to try to envision how this new functionality is going to work. And let's take a scenario. Jeff hires Jim for the IDAC Corporation and Which I would requests, never do. I would never hire a place of Jim. <laughs> well, we don't have a cafeteria menu either, All Jeff, right. so I would like to file a complaint. It's been getting very boring in terms <laughs> of what we eat. But let's just say Jeff wants to give Jim access to the cafeteria menu on you know, one of his first days, and that's not a birthright provision. Walk us through kind of how the system evaluates that and decisions on it. Yeah. So the way to think about this is, you know, uh, when Zilla integrates into all the systems in HR system and so on, now we have a good map of, uh, you know, of what type of indig- individual gets access to what. And now we can... Uh, answer the question of with a high degree of confidence uh, and uh, you know if Jim walking into uh, into the corporation with so and so job function as identified by different attributes that that are there in the HR system um, what must Jim have access to and what may Jim have access to right uh and then the uh, you know the last thing is that everything else is just outliers right so if you sort of think about it and this is probably how we as humans might even think about it logically speaking right it just has not been very easy to operationalize um and so it's like you know if you if you've determined that this is what you must have access to in order to be able to do your job then those just in some sense should be treated like birthright access. Um, and if there are other entitlements that, that you may get, then those could be things that are, in some sense, not standing entitlements, but perhaps pre-approved, pre-approved in the sense that you ask for them, you get them. Nobody needs to review and, uh, and approve, right? And so you get it. Uh, and then there's a separate decision that application owners can make on whether they are uh, standing entitlement, so whether they are ones that are time bound or, uh, or or whatever that is, right? But it's it's sort of like you know this is what you must get, and and then therefore uh, it is something that I, as an application owner, have determined. It is something that I don't need to review it. It is something that I can present as defensible to an auditor. An auditor looks at it and goes, okay, here is your great. This is your review. Here is this thing that you told me. This these sort of people may have. And that makes sense to me. I don't need to look at every single uh, granular entitlement, or I may want to look at. It. I'm an auditor. I don't know what I'm going to want to look at, right? Like, or I should rephrase: the rest of us don't know what they're going to want to look at. Um, and you know, the the, the funny thing is that uh, you know, e- every auditor is different, and um, and every auditor uh, in every audit firm is different. So. Uh, but at the end of the day, we think of it as like, I, I don't really care, right? Like I want audit is a business outcome that just got to happen, right? Or rather, a successful audit is the business outcome. <laughs> <laughs> right, the audit can take place. And that was all it took to be successful. I think there are a lot of happy people out there. <laughs> uh, and so, so, you know, so making that defensible in an evidence package that, hey, this is our practice, right? Um, and... And so that's sort of the shape of the uh, the solution. I hope it logically sort of makes sense, um, you know, to all of us. So, uh, and then, then you know, people get what they need. People can request what they need. It doesn't get gunked up in in approval process. And then the reviews are streamlined. So it's a uh, you know deliver value in in all of these three different different. Uh, Legs of the stool, if you will, right? 
We've talked a lot about this, this. This sounds like a like a data thing, right? Is we're pulling data. You've got all these connectors that are in place already, and so you're you're taking that data and say, okay, here's here's what we think is is what should be. And I would imagine then some IGA analysts or IAM analysts would probably look at that data and say, okay, do we need to maybe tweak our onboarding roles, or do we send this to the business and have them make a decision and sort of help with that modeling process? You talked about the auditor use case, which, of course, they're going to look at everything, and sometimes they don't even know what they're looking at. Sorry, that's my jab at at auditors. Uh, But what about folks like CISOs? I mean, I could imagine it'd be very powerful to get like their data back to say, here's what my organization has, and here's what people have access to, and what are some of the scenarios that you see like a CISO would take this data and help reduce risk for their organization? No, that's that's a very good question, right? So as a CISO, there's a bunch of different outcomes y- you would be looking for. The risk reduction is clearly, um, you know, clearly one. There is there's another outcome you want is that you don't want you, you want to be a partner to the business, and you want to enable uh, the business, and that means you know being able to uh, make people efficient and productive, and so on and so forth. Uh, the other thing you want to be, of course, is you're, if you're responsible for a compliance outcome. You want to make sure that happens, right? Because that is, again, a business outcome as far as, uh, as, far as you're concerned. So as, as a CISO, you, know, you, have to, uh, you have to do all of, all, all of those things. And then in, you know, in terms of risk, risk reduction, uh, getting people to least privilege in a manner that doesn't in you know, doesn't have them pulling their hair out every time, right? I think that's a that's an important. Um, so, uh, so sort of just evolving, evolving uh, this practice as they go. I mean, it's interesting you put it the way you put it, uh, Jeff, which is that it's all about data. I mean, isn't it amazing that the entire industry has done so little with the data that we're just sitting on? Yeah. Right. Um, and. Uh, and and so that's uh, you know, I feel like as an untapped resource that it's people really aren't resource. leveraging the organizations. You know, right. it takes a while, right, for cycles to for for you know, the organizational cycle for investment, right? Identity access management tools typically are not very cheap, and it requires resources to run it. And so it takes time, right, to get those tools in place. And you might have a good idea now, but it really doesn't see adoption until five years, 10 years, whatever that upgrade cycle looks like. But man, I mean, these organizations are sitting on a treasure trove of data that could absolutely reduce risk. And a tool like this sounds awesome to be able to say, hey, what are we doing with that data? Let's pull it back. Let's do something with that data. I mean, it doesn't do any good sitting in a in a SIM or some other logging tool where it just doesn't do anything until something bad happens. Like, that's right. more proactive. And- that's right. And and also, you know, let's be more proactive and also be able to tap that data when you do need to pay attention to something. Right. So I'll give you an example of, um, you know, the the recent incidents that happened around around Snowflake. Right. And, and you know, if you, if you think about it, the, it was essentially a chain of events where there happened to be certain service accounts tied to Snowflake databases and these accounts didn't have MFA on them. Right, and so they were susceptible to password spray attacks and what have you. Right, it's always now, the basics. <laughs> it was it was really the basics, right? And so if you think about it, when 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 something like now, first of all, you would think you want to be proactive and you want to be able to catch this uh, very uh, you know very proactively, right? So so that's certainly one outcome you want which is, hey, if you have a risk reduction strategy of having multi-factor authentication across the board, you as the CISO should be able to say, answer the question, where are my risks associated with this lack of control, right? But the other side is that when an incident does happen, you should just simply be able to ask the question, where does this affect my organization? And I think a system like Zilla will, and many of our customers got that answer, um, you know, practically right away, uh, because because that data was there in their Zilla system, right? And and at an enterprise scale and an enterprise security team um, should be able to si- similarly answer the question: Well, which one of the twelve hundred Snowflake instances we have across the board that have this problem, and what is the extent of that problem, right? 
um, and that's also another interesting uh, interesting dynamic that we'll see unfold over the next few years in this industry at large, right? Which is the the security threat detection, threat hunting teams that have sort of kind of stayed away from identity, right? Like we're not bad people, uh, <laughs> but but, uh, but like the whole, you know, having uh, operationalizing this uh, this identity data as part of the SecOps is also some, SecOps practice is also something we will see evolve over the over the next few years. Again, in part of what we all know uh, as identity professionals, that it really is like increasingly going to be more relevant uh, for security. So, so Nitin, one of the things that we end up debating on the show maybe every episode or at least every other episode is where's identity three, five years down the road? What's going to have the biggest impact? And nine times out of 10, it's AI. Well, you guys aren't waiting five years, right? You're you're getting some of the benefit of that right now with Zeus, what we talked about today. It seems like, you you know, if we just ask you the question, what's going to be the biggest pack up, impact on IGA five years on the road, you would have said AI. My question for you is, what's next? What's the future for Zilla security? Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, the 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 future for Zilla security. We we are, you know, we we are really excited about this particular uh, space and 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 the importance of identity as we see in the future around security and and compliance and everything else. Uh, so we really want to bring uh, sort of this modern automation centric approach to uh, to bear on the problem. And sometimes the solution calls for creative uses of AI and ML, like what we talked about. Sometimes the solution calls for creative uses of different forms of technology like Zeus and uh, and bringing it all together in a simple, easy to use, intuitive interface, sort of pulling together a complete solution. That's how we see, uh, you know, that's how we see us evolving, uh, you know, not not building techie solutions for techie sake, right? Where you have to go every integration, you have to configure it, you have to bring up a JDBC driver, you got to go do this, that, and the other. Like none of that, right? No other vertical does this. I don't understand why why we, we would or should. Um, I tell you so, special like that. <laughs> I, I, you know, we are very special. <laughs> So, so that's sort of how um, you know. That's sort of how we see it, and and so you'll see us bring uh, bring uh, as appropriate AI to bear on the age-old integrations problem. You'll see us bring in AI to bear and other creative solutions to uh, to the classic roles problem. You'll see us do a lot more automation in terms of helping the lives of. Uh, you know, people who are worried about compliance easy. Uh, and there's a lot there uh, in in all of these three. And then you'll see us helping uh, the security and SecOps teams uh, with the Zilla product uh, as the, you know, the spaces are just no doubt meant to, meant to get closer and closer. So you're used to looking to the stars for inspiration and to find out what's next. That was my very clever segue to get into what <laughs> I really clever. want to ask you, which is <laughs> astronomy. We were talking before we hit the record button. You mentioned that you're a amateur astronomer. Now, I'm going to say you said you're an amateur astronomer, but then you said I, I was it co-rent or co-own a uh, telescope. Okay. When you say I co-own a telescope, that doesn't strike me as amateur. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting, right? The 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 professional astronomers are the people who get PhDs and such, and really, you know, s- spend their day job uh, day job doing astronomy, well, whereas we're day job doing identity and identity security, and then as a hobby uh, doing astronomy. But yes, I think you know, uh, there's there's multiple uh, very very active astronomy clubs uh, throughout the country, no doubt. But one of the oldest ones is here in the Boston area. Um, and uh, believe it or not, at that time, a hundred plus years ago, when it started, it was called the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. Uh, 
And so, and so the name is stuck. Um, and, uh, you know, because back then, of course, making a telescope was a big deal. There was no easy way to get one. Uh, and so, so we joined that uh, astronomy club all 20 plus years ago, actually, maybe 25 plus years ago. So you're a um, long timer. <laughs> oh, oh, in, and and we really enjoyed being part of the astronomy club, and we would go on uh, long uh, camping trips in dark sky areas with the astronomy club north of Maine, and um, and then a, a, a few of us got together and purchased a telescope that's uh, that's lovingly called the Godzilla, and uh, <laughs> and it has a thirty six inch mirror, uh, which is a very large mirror, uh, but. Uh, you know, it's very impressive to kids because it stands 15 feet tall, right? Like, so it's like, whoa, what is this thing? <laughs> and um, I think and it's amazing. It, it's in a trailer too, right? This is not. And it has its own trailer. Yeah. That is correct. It has its own trailer. Uh, and it's a very, you know, the, it's beautifully engineered with all the trusses and things. And you have to put it together and you have set it up. And it takes about an hour to set it up and, not, you know, a little less than that to tear down. Um, and so we would have a great time with it. And I say we would because, uh, you know, in the intervening years, kids came along and astronomy has been on a bit of a hiatus <laughs> for, a, for a period. Um, uh, but uh, but that, that telescope is incredible. It's the, it's the largest telescope on the eastern seaboard here. Oh, wow. So Boston is the birthplace of IGA. It has the biggest yes. telescope on the eastern seaboard. <laughs> I feel like there's like some there's some grassroots movements that need to come here. Like, can we get that written into like. I don't know, the, the Constitution or something for Massachusetts or something like that. <laughs> it, it, we should, right? The only thing Boston doesn't have is, is, a, is, is weather that is not very friendly to doing astronomy, right? As and a so Chicagoan, I can, I can absolutely empathize. That's why that's I moved right. from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Nitin, Nitin, I'm wondering, does the light pollution of being in the Northeast and being near a big city like Boston, does that affect your, your amateur astronomy it absolutely does and in fact it, it gets worse year after year after year in fact there is a uh, you know one of my uh, you know friends from the astronomy club is very very passionate about uh, about light pollution and so on an advocate uh, advocate across multiple towns and and you know the tragedy of all of this is that it doesn't have to be like this right it's like why would you take a, a, a light and point it up when really you want to see what's on the ground <laughs> that you don't report? <laughs> Unless you're so Batman. You'd think, <laughs> so you'd think it would, be, it would be the most common sense thing to do, which is to have these full cutoff lights that are pointing to the ground and not necessarily leaking light to the, to the sky. But it is what it is. Um, and so, yes, you have to seek out, you know, darker skies and... And it's amazing when you do, and you can see the Milky Way in the sky. Uh, it's unbelievable. It's, yeah. I mean, you can see that with the naked eye in places like Utah, even. Yes. I was on vacation in central Utah, and just the, you can see the Milky Way and kind of like these clouds of, I guess, there's gases in the universe that you can, it's just, it's mind blowing how much mind -blowing. more you can see in a dark, state i guess is the way to put it versus near a city that's correct it's mind-blowing i mean there's a bunch of things like this that are very mind-blowing when you look through a telescope i think the one that comes to my mind is uh is something called the orion nebula you know i don't know if you ever ever had a chance to see it it's sort of like in the sword of orion the hunter and even if you take a, a decent pair of binoculars and point to it you can actually see what looks like a star is not a star right and um and through a telescope like that, the one that we have, uh, you can actually see an incredible amount of detail. You can actually see like, you know, like this fog around stars. That fog is like has structure to it. And um, and it's amazing because that's where stars are being born. Right. And so now it's like, oh, my God, like talk about blowing, you know, your mind. Right. Like stars are being born because gas is coming together and with gravity. And you can actually see that. Yeah, the one, I think what's also mind blowing is like when you're looking at a star being born, that might have been five billion years ago. Exactly, that's right. By the that time is... that light actually reaches the Earth, that's how long it takes. It could be on the decline by now. Yeah, 
<laughs> that you might see the birth and, and end of it all in <laughs> in a in a very flash of a pan or a flash of, a, of an eye, so to speak. Yeah. That's so a- I mean, my I, I'm not an astronomer, as in hands on like Newton is, but I watch a lot of these YouTube videos, and you know, with the the Hubble telescope that was launched, what was it like 40, 50 years ago or something like that? The amount of things that they're seeing now deep into the universe. They're starting to have new understandings about the universe and things like the, you know, I mean, if you go back a hundred years, astronomers thought the extent of the universe was what we call the Milky Way. Now it's the galaxy that our solar system is somewhere in the middle of. It's one of, what is it? Millions or billions, billions I think, uncountable yeah, I mean, yeah, of this, galaxies. Yeah. This is totally where we start getting into the observable versus the unobservable universe, that's right? Correct. Yeah, <laughs> that's correct. Exactly. You know, hey, uh, invite for you guys. If you're ever in the Boston area, we'll find time to go find a dark, dark spot, and and hopefully the clouds will cooperate, and we can go look at some cool stuff through our telescope. I will absolutely take you up on that. So be that careful. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, very. And cool, we can actually. talk identity while we're at it. Yeah, right? Well, let's be honest. Identity <laughs> is still at the center. No matter how many of these nebula <laughs> and galaxies are at, identity is still at the very center of all that. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and wrap it up for this episode. Nitin, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. It's been really great to kind of catch up with you and really kind of understand where Zill is coming into this. I'll have links in our show notes for people to connect with you on LinkedIn if they have questions, whether it's about IGA or Zilla or astronomy. Either way, I'm sure. I'm sure you're happy to engage on that. Uh, go out, visit the website, zillasecurity.com, Z-I-L-L-A security.com. And of course, you can always visit us on the web, idacpodcast.com. Uh, we're on YouTube. Come check out our YouTube channel. You can see the faces uh, of these conversations that are taking place at idacpodcast.tv. That'll take you right to us. So I think with that, we'll go ahead and leave it for this week. Nit and Jim, thank you so much for your guys' time this week. And we'll talk with everyone else in the next one. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.